Okay, chapter 14 is uh, again about plants, it's botany. And uh, in chapter 13 we talk mostly about structures of the, of the plant and kind of what their purpose was. In this one we're going to talk about processes, things that plants do. Uh, and obviously like photosynthesis will be one of those. Um, so the first thing it talks about in the chapter is the plant needs water, and what does it need water for? Um, the first thing is we're going to talk about that it needs water for is photosynthesis. When a plant carries on photosynthesis, in addition to chlorophyll and light, what does it need? What are the, like the raw materials for photosynthesis? Obviously, one of them is what? Water. And the other one is what you produce that plants like. What's that? Carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide is going to be the other. So carbon dioxide and water uh, are the two raw materials that plants need to carry on photosynthesis. Um, plants also need, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later in this section, uh, need water inside the cells to make them stiff enough so that the plants will stand upright. When a plant gets wilty, it doesn't have enough of this what we, inside the cell. We call it turgor pressure. And the plant starts drooping. Okay, So it needs water to be able to make the plants plump enough so that they don't droop. Um, Another thing it needs water for is to split complex molecules into smaller molecules. And we call that process of splitting hydrolysis. Hydro comes from water. And then the lysis, we've had that before. Lysis meant to split. So we're going to split a complex molecule into smaller molecules by adding water to, uh, or it's water is required in that process. Okay, here's an example. Here's a complex molecule, and we want to kind of split it in two, and water is going to go up there, and in the process of splitting, water is going to come up here. This needs an extra hydrogen over there, and this needs an OH over here. And it ends up forming two molecules. So each molecule, when it was split. So to actually form this molecule originally was just the opposite of hydrolysis. It was called dehydration synthesis. We're making a bigger molecule by subtracting water out part of, from one molecule and part from the other to make water and putting it together. Now we're doing the reverse of that. Okay. So the other one might be for storage. This one's now probably has materials that are needed by the plant right now for immediate use. Okay, another thing that uh, plants need is for circulation. What nutrients that are in the soil can only get to all parts of the plant by being dissolved in water. They have to be dissolved in water and they're carried through the vascular tissue that we talked about in the last chapter to the different parts of the plant, to the stems, to the leaves, or other parts of the root. Okay, um, And also it would uh, be necessary to carry like glucose to other parts of the plant for energy. So glucose is going to be dissolved in water and then it will move it. So it doesn't move it as a solid, it moves it as a dissolved solid. Um, so, the first thing, or the next thing we want to talk about is how does a plant get water from the roots to leaves that are high up in the tree? And let's say this is a big tree, 100 foot tree. Not as big as the redwoods and sequoias that are in California, but still nonetheless, for our area, that is a tall tree. Living in Kansas City, we had some tall trees. I think they're in like the 70, 80 foot range. But how could the, how could water get out of the soil up to those leaves that are up there 70, 80 feet in the air? Well, what are the things that we know uh, how water can move? Well, one of the ways is with root pressure. 
Okay? Remember we have osmosis. Water moves from area of high concentration to low concentration. So, and then from high, con that'll be then higher than the next one, and so it just constantly keeps moving like that from high to low, which now makes this higher. This is higher than this is, so it'll move there, and it just keeps going like that. So that's by osmosis. Um, so there's pressure in the roots, so it'll have higher pressure in the roots than it does higher up in the tree. Okay, so water builds up inside the root, causes water to move up the xylem. Remember, xylem is the one that carries the water and the nutrients from the roots up to the leaves. Now, another thing that you may not know about, you might have heard this word. We, you know that in our circulatory system we have capillaries, um, and these are just tiny little vessels. So, But capillarity is what thing we have, loomed, have observed is if you have a tiny tube put down in water, that often the water in the tube will be higher than the water outside of it. So let's imagine that you had a glass of water and then you had a small, clear straw. If you look at the straw, the water inside the straw will be a bit higher. What's happening is the water likes to cling to the surface and actually climbs up a little way uh, against gravity. It only goes so far, but that will work. And that we've discovered that the tinier the tube, the higher it will go. So that's one of the reasons why the xylem and phloem, the tubes are so small. That's also, I mean, the, the reverse of that would be, that's also why they're not like a big old tube going right up to the center of the tree, because the water couldn't move up when it moves better when the tubes are small. So tiny tubes just have a lot of them. Now, the method that we think right now explains how water can get all the way from the roots up to the leaves that are high up in the tree is a, called a transpiration cohesion theory. We're putting a couple thoughts together that we know about water. Now, first thing we have to talk about is what's transpiration? Well, some of you have probably observed this. If you have plants growing um, like in a terrarium, you know, where you have glass all the way around, have you noticed that it often gets wet on the inside? And the reason why it gets wet on the inside is because inside the leaf, some of the water is evaporating going through those holes in the bottom of the leaf, stomata, and it's evaporating. So the leaf is actually evaporating water out through those stomata. So that's decreasing the amount of water up in the leaves, right? So there's, it's a lower concentration up there. Okay, so we're, we're creating a place, we're actually creating a lower place in the leaves with uh, this evaporation that's coming out of the leaves. Then, water tends to stick to itself. Have you ever noticed that, uh, I, I, we probably all have done that, have two water droplets that are on the table and you kind of push the water droplets until they touch. What do they do? And they become one, right? So there's a lot of cohesion, a lot of, they stick to each other. So, as water is leaving in the leaves, they're tugging on water molecules in that direction. They're helping to pull them up. So we have root pressure, we have capillarity, but the majority of this, that as the water evaporates out of the leaves, it pulls them up. Now, what do we know about trees, particularly at this time of year, which is winter? Does the sap, we call it again, the water and the nutrients and stuff, does the slap, sap flow upward in winter? Now we often talk about trees in spring. The sap is starting to flow. Why doesn't it go in winter? There's no leaves up here. There's nothing to evaporate and nothing to pull. So they just kind of stay that way all winter until they can, it starts growing <laughs> leaves and we get the whole process going again. Uh, so this is our current way of explaining how you can get water to be pulled up from the roots to leaves that are 
hundreds of feet in the air. Now, have you ever seen this? There's only certain plants do this, but it's called guttation. And what happens is this water that we said he, that is evaporating um, out of the stomata. Uh, it says when droplets of water are forced through the stomata. Now these are not, this is not the evaporation part. These are actually droplets of water that are coming out from the stomata. This would be the front side of the leaf. So in other words, the water would have come out on the back side and then these veins help the water kind of drain to the edges of the leaf and form little droplets around the outside. So those are droplets that are there because it rained. Those are droplets because the plant is actually putting out these droplets of water and collecting. What do you think the environmental conditions would have to be like for this to happen? Hot and dry or warm and wet? It'd have to be nice and moist, right? The plants would probably have the roots are in nice warm soil. It's humid and things like this. Probably not the other, not the opposite of that. Now, we talked about that turgor pressure, the pressure of water inside the cells. And uh, let's talk of that in the context of wilting, like we did before. Uh, some of you have noticed that in summer, especially after it's, it starts growing, going into more of the dry season of summer, that if you have a garden, that some of the vegetables in the garden look pretty wilty. Means that soil is probably starting to dry out. The plants have continued to evaporate water through the leaves. They probably closed up as much as they can to, to slow it down, but they kind of get wilty, especially in the afternoon. And then what happens often when, when after the sun goes down? The, the roots are now able to catch up with the loss of water up there, and the plant starts looking normal again. Uh, one of the things my wife and I have learned about growing house plants, even plants outside for that matter, is, is that there are many plants in your house get killed because people water them too much. You think that's a good thing. Unless you have a way for the water to drain out the bottom of your pot, the roots are going to end up just be sitting in water, which you think, well, that's a great thing. Well, what happens if I hold you under water long enough? You drown, right? You can't get enough oxygen that way. And your roots drown. Roots need oxygen just like you do, you know? And um, so, you have to have some way for oxygen to get in the soil for the roots to, to continue to grow. So they get their own oxygen. Yes, oxygen comes through diffusion through the plants, but not fast enough if you're going to drown the roots. So what we've learned in our house plants is that we go until the leaves look a little lower today than they did yesterday. It's starting to wilt. Then we water it. And it's amazing how fast a plant will revive. You water it and, and, you know, 15 minutes to half hour, it's standing nice straight up, you know, because it's now wet. And we won't water it again until the, it does it again. So we let the, the plant kind of tell us when it needs to be watered. It doesn't work really on plants, you know, that grow for year after year and they have hard stems. They'll stand up like that, but the leaves might still look real good, you know. So this is a temporary kind, and, he, and they'll pop back from that. Uh, and in fact, they kind of like that, really. Most, most of them, we, they grow quite well. Now, here's one where we've maybe gone a little bit too long, okay? And uh, what has happened is that the tissue has lost so much water that the tissue is starting to die. Uh, and they start turning brown uh, or black or, you know, any other color you think of when, they, when they've gone a little bit too long without water. Uh, Often these would be like plants that grow on their own. They're not dependent upon humans to water them. Or it could be people that went away on vacation. Uh, my son and his family will go away on vacation for four or five weeks at a time. And there are some things that 
were growing nicely in their yard before they left, but there's been nobody there to water it. And when I come to mow their lawn, which I didn't have to do that last summer, they, you know, these plants look pretty bad. They, some of them look like they're far gone. She had one plant last year that I was amazed at how many times it looked like it was getting close to this. And then we'd have a rain, and then it would look pretty good. Never looked great, but looked pretty good again. So it was always getting right on the bench, right on the edge of permanent wilting, and then to be come back with some rain. <laughs> okay? So now the dam, I mean what could cause this too is there's something interfering with it with the leaves getting the water that they need. It could be insects that are chewing on it, right? You know, and damaging the vascular tissue. It could be a fungus that grows on the plant and um, is absorbing the water or, it, or plugging up the xylem. Um, there was a, when I, uh, when we lived in Kansas City, there was a, a disease called Dutch elm disease and it would plug up the tubes, the, the xylem tubes in the tree and so the, the water can, couldn't get from the roots up to the tree and then finally the top of the tree just dies. Yeah. So it could be a fungus or bacteria. Plants can have bacterial infections too. They don't infect us, because remember, infections typically have to have certain uh, environmental conditions, and only certain living things have those conditions you know, to infect them. Okay, uh, now, next thing is something called mastic movement. Now, you've probably heard the word nasty, but it has nothing to do with that. But mastic movements are movements the plant makes uh, that are temporary. In other words, they, they move in, in position. Now they can't, plants don't walk from place to place, so it's going to have to be movement of the plant in, uh, in its stationary state. Uh, but it's reversible. In other words, this is not, it doesn't do this and then stop doing it. It can be reversed, and it's all based on how much water pressure is in certain uh, cells. And if not all the cells have the same water pressure, then you know, it'll push one way or the other because of that. Now here, um, and this, uh, it says here, it does not depend on the direction of the stimulus. You know, if the stimulus is down, doesn't necessarily mean that the reaction is going to be down. Could be up, you know? Like tree, plants grow up even though gravity pulls down. That's a stimulus. So it knows how to go Okay, gravity's in that direction, and I'm going to grow in the opposite direction. So plants respond to stimuli like that. Okay, now what are some types? Well, one type is called thigmonastic, uh, and this is the one that I referred to, I think it was last week when we were, uh, I forget what we were talking about, but uh, when I lived in Kansas City, there was a tree called a mimosa, and its leaves are like this, okay? There are tiny little leaflets attached to uh, a petiole right here. And the interesting thing about this one is if I touch the leaf, it will fold itself up towards the middle along the petiole. These leaflets will just fold up. Notice these on this side weren't touched, only these on this side, but they both move. Okay? Okay, another one is uh, nictinastic. Um, have you noticed that flowers will sometimes close up at night? Uh, we have, uh, my wife uh, has found these uh, hydrangeas, this, and we have this gazebo, and it, she's found the perfect spot for it because it produced hundreds of blossoms this year, and often they're about this big amount. They're huge. But at night, they close up. You know, nobody there don't see them anyway. I guess no. They just close up at night. So that would be an example of that. Okay? Um, what do sunflowers do? What do you know about sunflowers during the day and at night? They follow the sun. Okay? So if the sun comes up over there, their, their, their shiny little faces is just constantly aiming toward the sun until the sun goes down. 
And the next day, if the sun comes up, they have to turn all the way around. And they fade. So every time you look at a field of sunflowers, you know, where they're growing a whole long, long field for, they're all facing the same way for that reason. Otherwise, they should be aiming whatever. You know. Another one of the, uh, okay, now this is back to uh, plant circulation, is um, movement of carbohydrates within the plant. Um, the, you know, in spring, the, the carbohydrates that were stored in the roots last summer and fall are going to be used to grow new leaves and stems and twigs. So we need those to move upward. So they need water to circulate that around. Whereas as leaves produce carbohydrates, they need to be moved to nourish other parts of the tree as well as go down to the roots to be stored for next year. So how does that move around? Okay. How, does, how does it move around? What's our explanation for that? Now remember this is a model, it's a theory. Theories, remember, explain why things happen. Uh, it's our explanation. Now, can theories change? Yeah, we might need to change it when we find out different evidence that shows that maybe this is a better explanation or that isn't adequate or something like that. And uh, the current theory of explaining how carbohydrates are moved from place to place, one is through active transport. Now, we had that word a number of chapters back. Active transport means the the cell has to put out energy, use up energy, to actively move stuff across the cell membrane. So that's what we mean by that. Oh, and the other thing was, I forgot, osmosis. Remember that, through a semi-permeable membrane. But some of these molecules can't get across on their own unless they're helped. And we had two ways that were helped. One where it doesn't expend energy, and the other one where it does. This is the one where it does. Um, now, remember, plants don't eat as such, with the exception of the, what? Venus flytrap, right? It, it does, uh, can eat other things, uh, uh, like insects. Um, but they do absorb their uh, minerals out of the soil. That's where they get most of it from. But the soil can become depleted. What do we do here in Nebraska, well, in Iowa, that helps with that problem? What do we do when, uh, as far as our crops? We ro rotate the crops. So if this field this year had corn on it, next year we're going to grow beans or soybeans. And then the next year, corn again. Soybeans put some nutrients into the soil that corn depletes. And uh, so that's one way of replacing it, is with crop rotation. Another way is with fertilizing. We could grow corn every year, but we would have to fertilize more. And farmers have just found in our area, it's cheaper to grow soybeans one year, which replenishes the soil, and we have a market for soybeans. And then it also helps us to be able to grow corn, because they can make more dollars per acre with corn than they can with soybeans, but it isn't as much if I have to pay for fertilizer. Another thing that some people do, maybe like with their uh, yard, their garden, you know, they'll mulch, you know, dead, dead plant material, and as it rots, these nutrients are dissolved and go into the soil. Uh, the, there is one more thing that's not listed here. Um, that when I was growing up in uh, Montana, well, actually, a lot of farmers did that when I was younger. Now we figured out, you know, like the corn and soybean rotation. But they would, every once in a while, would let the field stand idle for a year. not 
grow any crops. And it was called summer fallow, summer fallow, depending where you live, uh, how, how you pronounce it. And it was allowing the soil to rest so that it could replenish the nutrients. When Israel went into the promised land, that is one of the instructions that God gave to them, is that every seven years you were supposed to let this land set idle, not to plant any crops. And God promised that if you do that, I will make your crops the sixth year be enough to feed you for a whole year without growing any and still have seed left over so that you can grow it for the following year. How well did they do at keeping that? They didn't. In fact, that's one of the reasons they went into captivity is because they had failed to do that. Let the land rest. They had been doing that for 490 years. If I take 490 years and divide it by 7, what do I get? 490 divided by 7 is 70. How many years did they go into captivity? 70. God said, you didn't do what I asked you to do. Now the land's going to get all of it at once. For 70 years, nobody's going to grow anything. It's going to have a chance to be totally replenished. Then, you, then I'll bring you back and you can do it. You can start growing crops again. Well, that was one of the reasons. Now, it's not the only reason they went into captivity, but that's maybe the reason why they were gone as long as they were, is because they hadn't done what asked, God asked them to do. Now, were there consequences probably all along? Yeah. Their crops on the sixth year wasn't as bountiful as it could have been. Uh, and then probably their crops didn't produce like it could have because they failed to do this. And it just seems counterproductive, doesn't it? If I let my crops, my soil set idle, I'm not growing anything, that's a bad thing. But God said, no, I'll take care of you. Just like he did with the manna. You know, they weren't supposed to gather anything on the on the Sabbath, and he said, you know, you'll be able to gather enough on the day before, that you'll have plenty. And if they did go out and gather some on, uh, what, what did it do? It spoiled, right? Stank and got rotten. You know, God, God always had, had the whole thing planned out. Uh, now, okay, we already talked about insectivorous plants. Those are the ones that eat insects like the Venus flytrap would be our example. There, there's one called the, I think it's called the trumpet plant. It looks like a, a big vase, and it has liquid down in the bottom that's really tasty, but when the insects fall it and get down in there to taste it, they can never get back out. They fall in and become food for the plant. Okay? Uh, so that would be another one. Uh, now, uh, so the roots are the primary uh, places where nutrients are absorbed, and they have to move them from cell to cell by active transport. They have to expend some energy. So if the plant's a little bit too far gone, it's not going to be able to do that. Um, now, if you have excessive fertilization, if you put too much fertilizer on your plants, uh, like grass, if you put too much fertilizer on your plants, the grass will actually turn brown. Why? Because now you've created a lower area, an area of lower concentration of water outside the plant than inside the plant, and so water is moving out of the plant into the fertilizer, drying the plant out, killing it. So with that much fertilizer, you're going to have to water more, but then you have the trouble of overwatering and drowning the roots. So, you know, it's touchy thing. You know, you have to water just right. Okay, another thing about plants is plant is something called plant hormones. It's hard to imagine that plants have hormones. But what are hormones? Hormones are like chemical messengers. They're chemicals that circulate through the organism and they carry information to another part of the organism that will cause it to respond in some way. Now, 
Let's take something you're maybe a little bit more familiar with. Okay? Guys produce what? Sex hormone. Starts with a T. Testosterone, right? Okay? And females produce, starts with an E, estrogen. Now, when you are, before you go into puberty, the levels of those two are much the same. And that's the reason why up till about, what is it, about the fifth grade, boys and girls don't look all that much alike. Otherwise, I mean, in our school, girls have long hair and guys don't have long hair, you know? But otherwise, there isn't that much body structure difference between boys and girls up to that level. Now, once sixth grade about comes around, the girls start becoming like women. They start producing estrogen, and it goes to other parts of the body, and it responds by producing female features. Males, when they go through puberty, which is a little bit later, I'm not sure why God made it that way, but they start a couple years later, and they start developing male features. Their shoulders get broader without their hips getting wider. Estrogens makes the girl's hips get wider. Why? What is, what is God designing them to be able to do? Carry a baby. Okay, wider hips to carry the baby. Uh, and, uh, you know, they put more, uh, a little more uh, fat under the cells that makes their skin feel softer. They have breasts so they can feed their young. Uh, you know, and testosterone makes males have a beard. Their voice gets lower. Uh, they grow more hair on their body. Uh, you know, all those things like that. So do you see like a hormone, maybe it produced in one place, but it sends information to other parts of the organism to respond in a certain way. So that's what hormones do. Plants have hormones too. Plants have hormones too. Uh, now, in your book, it talks about a guy whose last name is Went, and a series of experiments that he did where he discovered the first, or discovered a hormone and what it did. Okay, so uh, let's, he began with a uh, seed here. Uh, somebody was asking the difference between a dicotyledon and a monocotyledon. This would be one of those dicotyledons that splits in half and it shoots up, sends up a little shoot that we call a coleoptal. Shoots up and then the roots go down, right? Shoots go up and toward, uh, away from gravity roots grow down. You actually take, put them in a, in a pot and turn them sideways after they started and they'll change direction. They respond to gravity. Uh, now, what he did is he cut the tip off. You know, the part that's the growing tip, the meristematic region of that, and the plant stopped growing. He then put this back on and it continued to grow. So there's something in that tip that influences growth. Okay? That was his first experiment. So in his second experiment, he did the same thing. He has a little tiny piece of auger. Now we talked about, when we're talking about algae, they could use auger. It's kind of like a Gelatin, you know, when you take gelatin to like make jello, you soak it up and it's all like liquid, but then you pour it out and it cools and it gets hard. Okay, so this the auger does the same thing. It's it's all like a liquid when it's in boiling water, but then you pour it out and let it set and it gets hard. Well, not hard, hard, but like jello. And so he takes this little tiny piece of auger, kind of like jello, and he first cuts off the tip, and he takes this tip and sticks it right on the auger. That's all he does, he sticks the tip with the cut part touching the auger, he leaves it like that for a little while, I don't know how long, and then he takes that auger and instead of putting the tip back on here, he just 
takes the auger and sticks it on the tip of the stunted stem. And what does it do? It starts growing again. So in other words, it was able to grow without the tip on it. So there's something that that tip is putting out that soaks into the auger that if I put that auger on top of the cut piece, cut uh, stem, that makes it continue to grow. So in his third experiment, what he did is he did that part the same, but then he decided, can I make just part of it grow? So again, soaking the something, some hormone, we know now it's a hormone, but something in here, and then he puts it on the end of the stem so it's only covering like half of it, and not the other half, and guess what happens? Only one side grows, or one side grows more than the other because it's the side getting the hormone, and so the side that grows, it causes it to bend over. So he's discovering, discovered a growth hormone, something that is with the hormone present will cause the cells to divide and elongate and cause the stem to get longer. So uh, what are some common plant hormones? Well, one group of hormones we call auxins. And this turns out to be the, the kind that we first discovered uh, was the first plant hormone. And their effects, they, can, they kind of cause all kinds of different effects. Each hormone does a certain thing. There's another one called gibberellums. Gibberellums. And um, sometimes referred to as foolish seedling disease. It's actually because they have this certain hormone. And what it does is it stimulates cell division and elongation, uh, kind of like rapid cell division and growth. Kind of like cancer, but it's not a cancer, but it kind of you know, where cells are dividing much faster and elongating than they should. Okay, uh, there's another one called the uh, cytokinins, and um, what they do is they stimulate cell division in plants and promote bud growth. So, for instance, when a tree next spring uh, will let out that hormone will cause buds to start forming on the trees. Now sometimes it will, we will see these long before spring when we go through a really warm spell. Have you noticed that sometimes the trees will, they're getting ready for spring, they're anxious, they're starting to put on buds already. But that's the hormone that causes a bud to form at that location. Now another one uh, is, is actually a gas and that's produced by something that's ripening. And it's called ethylene. And if you expose a, like bananas for instance, if you buy a green banana and expose it to ethylene, it will ripen all the way like this and, if you, and, and turn all the way to turning brown. So if you wanted the fruit to not ripen quickly, what would you do? find something that absorbs ethylene. We were shopping at uh, a couple weeks ago at the container store at West Road, and they actually sold that. 